Hello and welcome. In this video, I'm going to show you three things. Number one, typical things that students get wrong. Number two, a range of things you can do with examples to get right. And number three, how to turn those errors into successes, how to correct stuff that's wrong, which I think will be really beneficial. Let's dive into a descriptive piece written about a picture like this. It comes from a viewer who has decided to prepare a description in advance and then wants to adapt it to any kind of picture. So that is a bonus feature I'll show you at the end of the video, how to adapt your description to any picture that comes up in the exam. Here is the start of his answer. I'm going to dive into the bits in yellow to show you his mistakes before we then look at what is brilliant and my examiner's commentary to explain why. The most common mistake students make is they just put in random description which the writing doesn't need. Let's check this out with his description of the moon. The moon hung, brilliant choice of verb, halo framed, interesting, but halo suggests angelic. Has that got anything to do with this piece of writing? It doesn't refer to anything he's written before, and it doesn't really refer to anything that comes afterwards. So it's just there to describe. It doesn't actually help us. What did it illuminate? The cirrocumulus clouds. Well, who cares what kind of clouds they were? If the shape of the clouds is relevant to something later, put it in. But it isn't. We're going to scrap it which broke up the undulating and rippling patterns. Well, is the fact that the clouds are in patterns going to be important? Will it work in some symbolic way to help us understand the character or the setting? The answer is no, we're going to ditch it. The next bit of inappropriate description is nearly genius. So he describes the sky as a mackerel sky. This is totally surprising. We kind of picture fish skin, patterned in blues and greys perhaps, so we can see the sky in that colour, but it doesn't quite work because we're not certain what a mackerel looks like. It needs to work on a symbolic level, for example if we had fish imagery elsewhere, but we don't. What we do have is what should be a coincidence, but feels forced. Later on he's going to tell us that he went fishing for mackerel when he was a young boy. So this feels like an artificial link. Now he enters into some flashback, and tells us that he could see a lighthouse in the distance. This is the second most common problem, where you tell us something which confuses us. This sounds like the character on the bus is seeing a lighthouse in the distance now. So it just becomes confusing, we need to ditch it. The third way that description goes wrong is when you tell us something we already know. He remembered it like it was yesterday. Well, we know it's a memory, don't we? Because you've put it in the past tense here. His father brought him here a long time ago. The fourth problem is cliché. Have you heard this phrase before? Like it was yesterday? I think you have, so don't use it. Another cliché. The sweet smell of rain and earth filled his nostrils. Yeah, well, we kind of know that you use your nostrils to smell, so you don't need to tell us. And also, it's a cliché. Whereas when you read a novel, writers very rarely tell you about a character's nostrils, unless there's something significant about them. Here we have quite a good simile. Frothy waves like white horses galloping towards the shore. Which is nice, it's a descriptive technique. However, it's a cliché again, we've heard this one before. And even if we haven't, it doesn't fit the mood. So this is the fifth mistake choosing similes or metaphors that don't actually fit with what you've just said or are going to say. So we've just had, he'd watched the roar of the waves pounding on the rocks. It's threatening, roar gives us the idea of a predator. Now this doesn't work with the idea of horses which are more joyful, they're not predatory, and they seem happy here, they're frothy. Doesn't fit at all with what you've just said. It's only there to prove you can write an interesting simile. But if it doesn't fit the rest of your writing, it ain't interesting anymore. Now we have another fascinating simile. Heavy drops stinging the skin like some religious initiation. This didn't make sense to me at first. 
Because what religious initiation leads to the skin being stung? You probably can't think of one, although the writer can. But your references have to make sense to most readers, otherwise they won't work. Now, what he has in mind is self-flagellation, the idea of whipping yourself, which was a Catholic tradition and still happens in some societies in the modern day. So he could have changed initiation to flagellation, which would have been a much better simile, and one that we've never met before, to describe the effect of the rain on the skin. However, it would still have to fit the rest of the description, which is about an old man and his memories. If he blames himself for things, then the simile would fit. But actually, we don't get any feeling of blame, as you'll see, so it doesn't quite fit. Even though it's awesome, I would consider taking it out. Let's dive into the good stuff. He stared out the bus window. Kaleidoscopic strings of neon painted the night sky. So this idea that the neon signs are like a painting and also like a kaleidoscope are two brilliant metaphors. And rather than saying it was like a painting, converting that into a verb is much more powerful, it's more immediate. An old man shuffled on, ragged clothes, a faint waft of urine. This is Charles Dickens' favourite descriptive technique, I'd argue, putting things together in a list. It's a really quick way to build up that mental image for the reader, a picture painted in words through a list. Another man, middle-aged, sat opposite, reading a newspaper, shaking his head in distaste at some piece of news, his aquiline nose making him look like some old Roman emperor. Before we get to the very brilliant simile, that's another listed description. Does the simile fit the mood? Well, a Roman emperor would feel superior to what he's observing. And that fits exactly, doesn't it? This middle-aged man is feeling distaste. So it's a perfectly chosen simile. Now, the mark scheme for the top grades doesn't really help you understand. What does compelling, convincing mean? Well, I'm going to focus in on this word, crafting. The idea that you've taken the trouble to make everything fit together, like a carpenter who's built a brilliant bit of furniture. A young girl having an annoyingly loud argument on her phone sailed up the aisle. So now we have a brilliant metaphor. She is sailing like a boat, and that's going to be relevant next. All bony-hipped, mascara and lipstick, leaving a perfumed wake in her trail. So a ship or a boat leaves a wake behind. That's why the verb had her sailing up the aisle. Next, we get the sense of sound here. We're not told it, we're shown. We get that through the annoying, loud argument on the phone. Three words that help us picture, although that's a bit weird because it's our ears, but picture that sound. We hear it without having to be told what she was saying or that she was shouting and so on. Now, does the metaphor match the mood? Yes, because she's probably drunk, hence the bottle of vodka, she's going to be unsteady on her feet just like you feel when you're at sea standing on the deck of a ship, which works with sailing and the wake. And we've also got another brilliant listed description. So now I've changed the description of the moon to fit with that earlier description. The moon faltered, drowning in a darkening sea of cloud. So that fits the imagery we've just had about the girl who's like a drunken sailor, if you like, or a drunken ship. Now we get the idea of the moon also being affected by the sea, in this case, a sea of clouds. It's a new metaphor that fits with the old one. All of it joins together. Remember in the earlier description, it sounded like the lighthouse was right there and he could see it from the bus. Now I've changed the verb to wandered so that we know this is a memory. His mind wandered to the lighthouse. It's not actually there. His father brought him there a long time ago. His father had given him his fishing rod and taught him how to bait and cast it. So a flashback is a brilliant way to add events to your description, but not turn it into a story. Nothing much is happening while he's on the bus, so it's not a narrative. And the trick is to make the flashback relevant to what you're describing on the bus. It had been raining that day, the sweet smell of rain and earth. And it's raining now on the bus, so it makes sense that this memory would come back to him now. He had cast the rod against a slate-grey sky. He'd watched the roar of the waves pounding on the rocks. 
So now the mood is threatening, we're uncomfortable, just as the description of the people on the bus, or that he could see from the bus, were also uncomfortable. Now if we look at this final line, we've got that trick with the senses again. He doesn't tell us that the character could hear the waves, or that they were loud. Instead, we get a sense of the sound from this violent, vivid verb, pounding. Then the tug on the line, the darting and straining flash of silver just beneath the surface, and the excitement and exertion of his small frame landing his first fish, a mackerel. So this is a fabulous show-off sentence. It's listed again where you're building detail upon detail. But I've also picked it out because of the brilliant use of sibilance. Hopefully you heard me emphasise the S's when I read it out. And it creates both a feeling of peace and excitement as he's catching his fish. The verbs are vivid, darting, straining, which really emphasises the physical effort of what's going on. He remembered the immense pride he felt, the marble of the fight the fish had given him, all iridescent blue, green and silver. Again we get the power of the list. And I also like this because the colours aren't show-off ones like aquamarine and turquoise, which are just there to show you're describing. These colours actually fit the mood and the scene. The final sentence of the paragraph gives us a brilliant contrast. The horror at seeing his father dispatch it with a crack on the head. How life was extinguished so swiftly. So we've got a massive contrast with the subject matter, but now we have a structural contrast, which is genius. The sibilance that was so peaceful at the start of the paragraph has now become sinister, was extinguished so swiftly. It sounds soft, but it's describing a really harsh action. This is also a brilliant structural moment in the description because it makes us question the father. And this idea is going to be developed next. Let's do these two paragraphs together so you can see what I mean. We have a short paragraph for impact. It emphasises that a change is coming. He knew now that was the happiest he had ever been, the happiest he would ever be. This is a brilliant way structurally to show us why the memory and flashback has been so important, because it was a changing point in his life. Not long after that, he came home from school one day to find his mother standing alone. When she saw him, she sunk to her knees, a long, lingering silence. Beside her, the fire was out, just ashes, the ember turned grey. So we can infer from this, because we've been shown and not told, that the father is no longer there. The word alone emphasises that to us. We know that something is very wrong because she sunk to her knees. And this is also done through sibilance again, which links us back to that sinister sibilance we had before, which we associated with the father. Now, what the character can remember is symbolic. They're not just describing things because those are the things that were there. These are the details that work to make us infer. Beside her, the fire was out, just ashes, the embers turned grey. And so we now see this as symbolic of the parents' relationship. For whatever reason, they must have split up at this point. Now, in the original description, the student had told us instead of shown us. So he told us that the mother had a strange look on her face. Well, we can infer that from what you've just read. Instead of her just being shocked into silence, instead she screams with a contorted mouth, pain etched across her face. This is there to prove you're describing, rather than how a mother would actually behave, completely silence until their son came back, then falling to her knees and letting out a massive scream. I mean, that would be pretty extreme, wouldn't it? And then we don't need to say nothing would ever be the same again. That was so long ago. Why don't we need to? Because we already spelled that idea out in that brilliant short paragraph before this one. Now there's another short sentence structurally to show that there's a change of time. We're being brought back to the present. Everything had changed. That was so long ago. Now examiners really like this idea of a circular structure. It's really useful in a description because if you plan a normal sort of ending, it often turns into a narrative, a story. So a circular structure just has you coming back to an earlier description. 
Look how fantastically he does this. We go back to that image of the girl with the vodka bottle coming down the aisle in the bus. Well, now he looks out of the window. A young girl having an annoyingly loud argument on her phone stumbled up the path close by, all bony hipped mascara and lipstick, leaving a perfumed trail in her haste, a bottle sticking out of her coat. So there are subtle differences in the description so that we know it's a different girl, but the fact that he's seeing young girls appearing the same way gives us this idea of his cynicism and his disillusionment, which comes from his memories. Perhaps it's come from his relationship with his mother after his father left him. In the next paragraph, we're going to get alliteration with the D sound. The D fits the mood. It's depressing. It's downbeat. He stepped off the bus and looked up at the sky as the first drops of rain descended, darkening his thinning grey hair. Now we can see that the rain also reflects his mood, so it's pathetic fallacy. Heavy drops stinging the skin. Again pathetic fallacy, but also sibilance, and it's sinister again, which fits the mood of what we've had before. Then we have a contrast, which reminds us of the previous flashback when he was catching the fish. Sometimes the rain was beautiful. Silver streaks. Remember the fish was silver? Like waves, which brings us back to the sea in his flashback, dancing a waltz in the wind. Fantastic alliteration with the waltz and the wind. Peaceful sound, which again works with a contrast to the mood that he's feeling now in the rain getting off the bus. This simile also therefore fits the mood. The waves, instead of pounding like they did in the flashback, are now offering something positive. He remembered the kindness of damp afternoons, getting soaked to the skin, walking home from school, the solace of opening the door and finding everyone there. So now we feel sympathy for the character because he was happy when everyone was there. And this confirms our original inference that the father had left. So now we have the final sentence. It's symbolic again. It's not just what happens. He looked at the darkening sky. Time was getting on. It was getting late. So here the symbolism has to do with death. We get the idea that he feels A, that he is running out of time, or B, life's no longer worth living and he might as well give up. This mood is emphasised by this pattern of three, three short sentences. Now, normally I would complain about this. If the sky is getting dark, then we know the day is getting on and we know it's getting late. You're telling us stuff we don't need to know. But here, the purpose is to emphasise the darkness and lateness. It acts symbolically, so we allow it. It suggests that his earlier happiness in memory of the rain is something that only happens sometimes. It's too infrequent and most of life is a disappointment to him. So what do you want to do next to improve your descriptive writing? Well, go back to the picture and write your own version of this. Do it from memory so you won't actually be copying what was there before. You'll be writing your very own stuff. But it will be really high quality and you can then commit a lot of that to memory and then try it out with other pictures. How would it work with other pictures, for example, of a jungle or a desert or a mountain scene? Well, the crucial thing here was the rain, which we could easily bring into a jungle or a mountain scene, and then the flashback would be possible. There's no rain in the desert, but you'd get there through contrast. You'd have a description of him feeling desperately thirsty and dehydrated, which would then cause the flashback and memory of being by the sea, catching the fish and being in the rain. So once you've written some high-class descriptions of your characters like this, you will be able to fit them to any picture that comes up in the exam. Now, if you want to see some more description that examiners get really excited about, check out the video coming up now.